this because you're going against them. You're, you're unpacking them. You're trying to liberate yourself from these entanglements. And in doing that, you face them sometimes be almost like it seems to you the first time you face them. The, the flow of just going with the habits is so strong that only when you turn around do you feel the intensity of them. Uh, again, to give you a, a kind of mundane comparison, uh, now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, uh, but if you've ever been addicted uh, to something, mm, what, what are the possible addictions we could list? Not your own, of course. <laughs> Other people's. Tobacco, marijuana, cocaine, speed, television, work, work, huh? Lust, food, gambling. Okay, I mean you can go through the the ability for the human being to habituate into an addictive mode is very very strong, and this is what. Han Shan and the Buddha is talking about. We have this habituating tendency. It's the grasping. This is what grasping means. And we do this because we're trying to get identity security in a sea of, you know, of mutability. And we think by grabbing and holding onto these things, we actually get some liberation, but we become habituated, we become entangled. So when you try to break the addiction, it's really easy. You just say, I'm going to stop, and it's over. Yeah, you should be kind of smiling if you know anybody who's tried to do it. It doesn't work that way, right? What happens? Hmm? Well, you go, before you go back to what you're doing, you try to not, right? But it beats you. Yeah, it, it beats you. There's a kind of um, almost uh, all the neural pathways are set up to go this direction. And so when you try to stop it, you have withdrawal symptoms. You get edgy, you get irritable. It's not simple. And it takes real resolution and some discernment at this point to go forward. Are you talking to me or are you talking to somebody else? Huh? I don't want to be hallucinating during my lecture. <laughs> I'm hearing voices. Okay. Is this something I need to pay attention to or? Um, no, I think Alan's um, calling a lot about... Oh, okay, how to get this thing working. All right, so let's move on. So this, this habituation, this habituating, is what we're dealing with. So what he's saying is the first steps towards this liberation are somewhat discomfort. There's some irritability, not always, but most people will experience some. And his point in here, and this point of this text, is to have some discernment. So right here, the next passage goes on. Right here, you need to have discernment. You need to be able to penetrate and understand what's going on. First, you recognize it for what it is. What is it? It is the symptoms of breaking the habit. This is the withdrawal before the health. Okay? So you, you understand that. Because if you don't understand that, you'll think, oh, this isn't working. I, I came to the monastery here to meditate, and I was ready to just like enter nirvana. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> and when I sat here, all these thoughts and feelings and impulses and emotions started arising. I thought, well, I must be doing it wrong. Because I look at the statues and they all look like really cool. They don't look like they have any trouble. And if you look at everybody else, they pretend to be really cool too. <laughs> Everybody's being really cool sitting. And if you'd actually, if we could biofeedback, hook it up, and you could see and hear on a screen what was going on. You wouldn't think it was so cool. It would be bedlam. But that's what it is. And everybody's going through the same thing. All the sages, all the Buddhas had to go through this ground to get to what's called the original mind ground. So it's not a unique journey. So he's saying up front, be ready for this. Don't just retreat at the first blowback that you get. Actually, actually, the text in my teacher used to say, that's a sign that you're doing something right. Your faults and habits, and you don't like it, and there's a little bit of discomfort and maybe even a little uh, shame, remorse. Uh, that's good. 
That's part of the cleansing. He would also say, if you have these faults, but you don't recognize them, that's really a fault. And if not only you don't recognize them, but cover them over, then it even gets worse. So recognizing them, as uncomfortable and difficult as it is, is the first step to him. So that's why the text, and I'm going to show you another passage here. The text talks about this. When you begin this, you feel vulnerable, almost like a child again. You're not crisp and confident. You're not assured of yourself. There's a kind of ill at ease, um, a little bit awkwardness. You don't quite fit in the world every place. You go to the parties, they're not the same. Um, you know, you try to talk to somebody with sort of a confident assuredness, and you're not sure, and people ask you questions, you don't have the answers necessarily. There's this kind of stirred up, uncomfortable feeling, this is good. This is actually good. Because you're deconstructing the identity, the ego that's built around these habits. It's an edifice, it's a false mask, but you're used to it. And this is what you project out in the world. When you actually take that down and start to get real, you feel vulnerable again. That's cool, that's good. So you start, you should hang around with people that it's good to feel vulnerable with. <laughs> if that makes sense, these are called Dharma friends. <laughs> and you find Dharma friends because you want people who reinforce your discomfort. Now, don't take this out of context. So I'm going to take that line out of context and go down some road with it. Oh, I learned at the moment you should hang out with people that make you uncomfortable. That's not what I'm saying. When you're going away from the Tao, you hang out with people that make you feel comfortable. These are not your good friends. When you go into the Tao, you hang out with people that address, know, and understand your discomfort. Those are your friends. So your friendships will start to change if you do this. It's very interesting. Not consciously. You just start to gravitate to those that reinforce this path. You'll start to re-examine your career, perhaps, too. Because as you follow this naturally, as it starts to open up to you, you're, you have as if a compass, you have a, bra, um, a gauge, and it starts to correct your steps in very interesting ways. And things that you used to do don't feel so good anymore, and things that you hadn't done before start to feel really good. Meditating starts to feel like pretty nice. And other things don't. This is a sign of the return. Okay, so if you can put up there uh, the passages that I sent. I just show you, these are coming. This is all coming from this tradition of what we call self-cultivation. Self-cultivation. Okay, so this is a really uh, wonderful example. This is coming from what we call... Uh, the, the quietist or the quietism tradition. And the quietism tradition says you find yourself, you find liberation not by throwing yourself into the world uh, with this frantic search for pleasure and happiness, but by quietly, quietly listening to yourself, listening to your heart, returning and listening deeply. And that's why it's called quietism. You quiet down. So often the quietist would practice in the mountains um, in deep valleys, removed, or they go to retreat places like here on a Friday night. What you're doing here is 45 minutes of quietism. But in that quietism, you're starting to hear what's really important. Whereas in the noise up there, you're not getting anything that's really to be retained. So the quietists say, in order to figure out my, where I'm going, I have to be able to figure out what's motivating me. To do that, I have to listen to myself. I have to look at things as they arise. So this path, whoa, did that one expand? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so this is the first one. And here you have the paradox, the paradoxical statement. Uh, this is from, the, from a Taoist text. Some of you might know. Anybody know? It's probably the most translated Chinese classic, I think. The Tao Te Ching. Okay, this is, this is the Tao Te Ching. There's many ways to read the Tao Te Ching. Some people read it as a manual for governance, how the ruler should govern. But it's really an inner text. It's really talking about how you should govern yourself. When's the last time I heard a politician talk about governance? Okay. 
So what he's saying is when you begin this return, and pre previous to this, he says, in this path, the Tao, the only motion is returning. It's going back. And when you do this, you're going to feel vulnerable like a child again. And he's saying this is good because you have to unpack. Now the line says to remain whole, be twisted. To become straight, let yourself be bent. To become full, be hollow. Be tattered that you might be renewed. Now, given what I just said, you can actually see why that would make sense because in a sense, we've allowed ourselves to become twisted with the habitual energies and the coverings. And so now to become, uh, remain whole, we have to sort of straighten that out again. We have to get into the twist and let them straighten again. So to be whole, you have to go through the, the twisting, the untangling. To become straight again, you have to allow yourself to be bent. You have to go through the discomfort of straightening out. To become full again, you have to become hollow. Now this has many meanings, but the primary meaning, again, if, you, if we go back to the principle, all is whole and complete within, and it's only because we grab and attach and we get confused that we lose that intrinsic wholeness. So to become whole again means to empty out. To empty out. In other words, you're emptying out what is not real, what is not true. The accumulated junk is being emptied out in this process. And this, in the Tao Te Ching, they call learning by subtraction. Every day it says, or normal learning is encyclopedic. We add to our stock, we add to our stock. But in returning and getting the Tao, we reduce, we subtract, until we get back to the pure, still, original source, which has very little, doesn't need very much. That's why he says to become full, you have to become out. And then tattered that you might be renewed. Uh, in a sense, uh, if you think of it as a molting, <laughs> snakes molt, they shed their skins. That's a tattered kind of sense. And then out of that, of course, the classic example of this, anybody? The phoenix. The phoenix rising from the fire of cultivation, then the ashes are the slag, the dross that's been, and then there's this new original that comes out again. So these are metaphors or analogies to describe this process. Okay, is that it? I'll just look at the other line here. Um, don't look at the whole passage. I, I just put the whole passage. But the one I wanted to point you to is the line says, which of you can assume such murkiness to become in the end still and clear? Which of you can make yourself inert to become in the end full of life and, and stir? So again, he's describing the murkiness is allowing yourself to go into the false self, the false identity, and deal with that murkiness, cleaning it out. Because the goal in cultivation is to get rid of those tainted bija, those seeds, in the consciousness. And once they're removed, the nature naturally manifests by itself. So the murkiness is going back into the false self, the attachments, the grasping, and so on and so forth. But if you can go into that murkiness and remain calm, it will settle by itself. And then he says, which of you can become inert, quiet, still, settled. And it doesn't just mean in meditation. It means generally becoming much more centered and much more less driven to become in the end full of life and stir. Now here's the paradox because in that stillness what comes out is not a negativity or a denial but actually the fullness of life. And that's why in the Buddhist text it says true emptiness, truly emptying out all that's false. It's just wonderful existence. Paradox. Okay, so two texts. I could do more, but let's move on because uh, we're going to have a movie tonight. These seeds, he says, um, have discernment, uh, recognize them for what they are, then you can break through them. But do not allow yourself to be trapped in this cage. Do not take these states as something real. 
These are merely symptoms of the healing. So don't get moved by them either way. These states can come in many ways. Uh, they'll, they usually come through what's called the six gates. Anybody know what the six gates are? It's a metaphor. Front door, back door. It's eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mental faculties. So these states can arise as sights, things that you see. They can arise as sounds that you hear. They can arise as different smells, both pleasant and repulsive. They can arise as flavors and tastes. When you're meditating, right, let's, let's just say when you're meditating, uh, you might smell something, or you might hear something, or you might see something, okay? Uh, you might feel something. So eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body are physical sensations. And the text will talk about these. Sometimes you'll feel heavy. Sometimes you'll feel light. Sometimes you feel like you're floating. Sometimes you feel like you're just sinking. Sometimes you'll feel really calm. And then sometimes you just feel totally irritable, like you have a fever. And these can be all over the map. There's no end. Sometimes you'll start to shake or twitch sometimes. It's not good or bad. It's just part of the natural process. So through these six sense gates, different phenomena can arise. They can seem inside or they can seem outside or they can seem both. <laughs> Was that thing I, did I really see it? Or was I seeing it sort of only interior? Did I really hear it or was I just hearing an interior? This can happen. Some of you had these happen. Always during retreats, my master uh, would say, yo meo jingje. Anybody have any states? These are called jingje, states. And they're called states because that's what they are. They're illusory manifestations that come about because you're working on your consciousness. And so they're called states. They're called unreal, phantoms, and so on and so forth. But he would ask about it. And then somebody would report. That's how we got to know about what everybody was more or less going through. Some of you have had these? No hands? Yeah. Yeah. So what he's doing here is he's saying, first of all, it's normal. It's natural. Uh, don't get freaked out by it. Discern and know what they're doing. Don't allow yourself to be trapped by it. Now, trapped doesn't necessarily just mean afraid. Okay, be careful here. Some states can come where you'll get a little afraid. Uh, somebody was mentioned in the state last night they had when they were learning to memorize a mantra and they thought a ghost was obstructing them. Okay, and my teacher would say, oh, fart, fart. Pay no attention. Well, if, what if the ghost is real? So? What if the ghost isn't imaginary? So, keep going, keep going, don't be turned. But it's not the case that they're always negative. When he says, don't be trapped in this cage, they could be the opposite. You could get blissed out. <laughs> you could get so high. You just got this grin, this Cheshire cat grin on your face. Like, beatific. Wow, at the monastery. Oh, and you're floating around in this blissed out zone. That's also getting trapped by the state. The natural state is neither up nor down. It's pinged on, it's level and even. It doesn't have this roller coaster effect. So either one can be a trap. It's very tricky. So, I, I mean, it's very normal. Meditation cultivation is very normal. <laughs> Sorry. It's very normal. Now, awakening and insight is wonderful, but it's not the wonderful where you, you know, you just float off into bliss land. Okay, it's just wonderful because you're seeing things like they really are, and that's pretty cool. That's what makes it wonderful instead of esoteric. So be careful here. What he's talking about is they can be higher. Never give in to them. And most importantly, don't see them as real. These are illusory manifestations of your consciousness cleansing itself. I don't know how else to say it. So this is really important because if you understand this, no matter what comes up, you'll stay even keeled and you'll continue to make progress. 
If you don't understand this, a state will come, you will grab onto it and think, I'm enlightened. Or I've caught a demon. Either way, you, you moved. And that's the language the text says, you moved off center. So that's why in the Chan school, now you can understand this expression, if the demon comes, slay the demon. But if the Buddha comes, slay the Buddha. Now, wait a minute. But it's saying a good state comes, ignore it. Bad state comes, ignore it. Don't go after any state. Now the Taoists have this wonderful expression. They said, be like the big fish at the bottom of the pond, who's fat and happy and doesn't bite on any bait. No matter what bait comes down, that fish is just there. Not interesting. I'm whole and complete by myself. You can fish all day, and that fish will stay there at the bottom of the pond. Uh, Xu Yun had a wonderful expression. He said, you can also be like the turtle with the shark after it. So when the turtle has the shark af uh, after it, what it does, it's vulnerable mostly where? I know we're talking to people in the city. You might not have seen a turtle. You know what turtles are? <laughs> it's not those things in the middle of the road that guide you home at night. <laughs> Those are also called turtles because they're shaped like turtles. So turtles have a hard shell, right? Generally speaking, a shark can't really crack that. But if the limbs are out or the head's out, the tail's out, it can get it. So Xu Yun and one of his kaishers said, I want you all to be like turtles. So when you sit, he said, pull in your two legs, your two legs, your tail, and your head. That's your sixth sense organs. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue. Pull them in so the shark can't get it. He's giving a metaphor for pulling back your sensory apparatus so as not to be grasping, grabbing, looking outside all the time. That way, the shark can't get you. So you can analogize, what's the shark? I'm not going to go there. So he says, when this happens, you need to rouse yourself, get energized, be vigorous and brave. Now he's saying, pluck, your, pluck up your spirits here. Bring forth energy. Jing jin, be vigorous. Now, vigorous doesn't mean be hyperactive. It simply means get your energy up and be present in the situation. Don't go down and sink into torpor. But don't also just float away into some kind of bliss. Stay steady, constant. Like a captain steering a ship through the storm. Stay at your helm and don't leave it. Pick up your wato or your meditation topic. This is important. In other words, the reason why the state could move you is because you've lost your single-minded concentration. That's why the concentration is so important. I said before, it's using fire to fight fire. This is the fire you're fighting, these states. If you bring your mind back to single-minded concentration, these states have no way to get at you, and believe it or not, they'll evaporate. You think they're so real when they're happening, but if you bring your concentration back to singleness, they dissolve like snow in a fire. Okay, it's really interesting. There are nothing real about them. They seem so real. And yet when you bring your center and your concentration back, they completely disappear. And then another one will come up. But once you get the idea, you're okay. And that's what he's doing here. He's giving us the idea. There is nothing going on here, he says. Don't waver. Nothing going on. Unless you give it a kind of attention and then give it a kind of energy. It's really interesting. I don't know if any of you had this experience, but whatever state it is, if you simply come back to your meditation topic and stay centered, the state will pass by itself because it is indeed like a dream, illusion, a bubble, and a shadow. So you contemplate them thus. There's no greater power in meditation than the power of being able to single-mindedly hold your attention in the midst of all these states. This is where Gung Fu comes from. And when you do this, and if you look at the story of the Buddha, how many things he faced going through the final stages of his awakening. And each time he came back to the single-minded focus and concentration based on understanding the theory that if indeed all is whole and complete within me, anything outside that I might be attempted to go to would be a diversion and a stepping off of that ground. 
and then quickly these things dissolve by themselves. He says, you can ask yourself, where did this come from? What is this about? And you won't be able to find where it came from, what it's about, because it doesn't have any substance, other than it's coming from your own consciousness going back layer upon layer into the deeper ground of awakening. So he says, you should find an answer to this question. What he means here is, you're not going to find that it's coming from any place other than your own consciousness. Now finally, and this is where we get to tonight, um, stay on it. Stay on your meditation topic. Though ghost and spirit sob and wail, that this is both metaphor and real, it means inside, it's as if sometimes it's unbearable. Uh, Hunkshire and I used to call this the, the, the child, the spoiled brat, ego, ourselves. <laughs> and my teacher sort of liked that, so he said, yeah, you should talk to your ego like it's a spoiled little child. So you're sitting there and it goes, I can't do this, I don't want to sit, it's too hard. <laughs> it hurts. I can be on a party now. Why did you go to the party? I did a party like the birthday party. And I never meet anybody cool here. And then you, you go, okay, you can be upset, but if you're really good and you stay through the sit, uh, we'll go have pizza after or something. Really? Yeah, okay. So you talk to the child in this way. We, 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 we um, personified it as a child. And the master said, yeah, because sometimes you think it's this big giant. It's nothing. It's just a little spoiled brat, your ego. And you spoiled it for so long, it's running roughshod over you, just like a child who's out of control and throws a tantrum. You go, oh, no, stop, stop. <laughs> you try to, and my teacher would say, just ignore the child. So he would do, he said there once, we were doing this, and he said, I'm just going to ignore you. I'm not going to pay any attention to you. I'm going to sit here. If you want to sit with me, fine. You want to run away, that's fine too, but I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing. So you can imagine it this way. You can play with it this way that, you know, when you say hold steady, those ghosts and demons and spirits that are wailing might actually be real manifestations of something, part of the illusory thing. Don't pay any attention. But in most cases... They're the own sort of frantic voices of your own mind in rebellion. And you just treat them. See, this is a, you don't smash them. And you can get my bodger pistol. That's not what you do with kids, right? You don't smash it. You just, you're understanding, but you're not going to give in either. So you begin this ground of negotiation with the idea that ultimately you're going to be victorious here. So you want to be kind, but you don't want to be indulgent. There's a lot of parallels here. Now, those some people who haven't had kids work with the kids are looking at me like, what is he talking about? But anybody who's hadn't worked with kids <laughs> knows what I'm talking about here. Okay? So, last line. If you can do this, if you can stay on it, you can naturally pursue this, not retreat, not be turned by states, it says you will receive good news. Now we put this in quote marks because what does this mean? Some other texts say unexpect, unexpectedly the news arrives. When you're absorbed in this, when you're really doing it, you're not thinking of God getting awakened, you're not thinking of having insights, you're not thinking of having a deep sense of liberation. When you're really doing it, all of a sudden, lost in single-mindedness, this manifests by itself. This is the news. This is the beginning of the breakthrough. And it doesn't come from seeking. It comes from quelling the mind that seeks. <laughs> Another paradox. So this being said, um, now you can stay for this or whatnot, but I sometimes like to illustrate uh, these things when I can with more graphic presentations. The thing we're going to show right now is a little short clip. It's a dream. Uh, that's uh, one of those sounds that you ignore. <laughs> it's a dream that Kurosawa, the famous Japanese filmmaker, had at a stage in his life. The reason I like this is because it really illustrates the text of passage tonight. 
about being caught up in this very difficult uh, movement, this kind of return, then getting swamped by states where you feel like you absolutely want to give up, and then the rousing yourself to vigor and so forth. So this is from a, um, a series of vignettes of his dreams from his earliest childhood till he almost died, and the, the actual uh, DVD or the actual movie is called Dreams. This is just the one sequence from it. Are we ready? You want to maybe drop the lights? This is called Another Dream, the Blizzard. Okay. <laughs> Sorry we went a little over, but I thought it was really a beautiful illustration of tonight's passage about the, the difficulty of the of the trek, the meeting of resistance, the illusory state with the beautiful, ugly demon that tries to seduce them into falling asleep, his rousing himself to vigor, uh, pushing that off, and then the good news, discovering by sticking just with it, they weren't that far away. Um, so occasionally we get a, a something like this that really, in, in sort of mm, graphic visual terms, conveys something. And I, I think often with Kurosawa, he has images that are universal, that are coming from a deep uh, level of consciousness that really resonates. So I thought you'd enjoy that. Uh, okay, that's it for tonight. Any announcements or save your questions? Perhaps if you have them, we'll entertain next week. Tomorrow night, a lecture on the Amitamska Sutra at 7.30. Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Um, we have, well, for Saturday, our normal Dharma assembly is not going to be happening in the morning. What will be happening? We'll be um, having a funeral service for Mrs. Love Hall. I don't know if people recognize or um, know her, but we'll have a service for tomorrow morning. Um, other than that, I think everything else is pretty much the same. The same classes. Okay, so we're going to do the transference in English and uh, call it a night.